Hello and welcome to another edition of the 3D Printing 3D Friday talk show. And today we are going to be joined by some fantastic guests. Um, we have um, a great selection of experts to discuss today's topic, which is going to be distributed manufacturing. Um, and we have Randy Altshuler joining us from Zometry, Tim DeRossett from Jable Additive, and Wilderick Heising from BCG. Um, the main focus, as always, is uh, on interaction. And so we want um, you, the audience, to, um, to let us know if you have any questions for us um, in the chat. And that is on the right-hand side of the screen. If you click the chat button there, you can ask us questions throughout today's show. Um, now, the topic today is distributed manufacturing, which is um, very topical, actually, as if you've been following the news, you'll have seen Desktop Metals 2.5 billion deal this week, um, who are citing a strong secular tailwind supporting reshoring of manufacturing and supply chain flexibility. Um, it's also been said that the global supply chain is cumbersome and outdated. So what is distributed manufacturing and why is it of interest? Are we talking about something like home assembly of IKEA furniture, a 3D printer in every house, or is this something much bigger? Well, World Economic Forum certainly think this is a much larger um, topic, and they peg distributed manufacturing as one of the top 10 emerging technologies of the last decade. Um, not only a high potential to save the world, but also a reasonable likelihood of being mainstreamed by 2020. So maybe we're going to get into a bit of whether we're there quite yet. Um, and not everybody agrees on whether additive manufacturing is decentralizing production. And uh, when I spoke to uh, materializes Fried Van Crayen, um, he was actually highlighting how centralization has taken place in some industries touched by AM. For example, in the, um, in the hearing aid industry where companies are buying up distribution chains um, and only a few companies there can actually afford the full digital chain. So anyway, without um, any more rambling from me, let's uh, let's get into um, who is going to be joining us um, today. So um, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Um, and we have joining us from Zometry, Randy Altshuler. Can you tell, um, tell the viewers who you are and what you do, please? Hi, I'm Randy Altshuler. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Zometry. We're based in Maryland here in the United States. And Zometry is all about distributed manufacturing. We have an online marketplace connecting tens of thousands of customers with thousands of suppliers all around the world. Excellent. And uh, Wilderick, where are you joining from? I think we've got you on mute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Wilderick Heising. I'm joining today from Frankfurt. I'm a partner and associate director at the Boston Consulting Group. I joined some 14 years ago, and I'm a core member of the Innovations Center for Operations at the BCG, at the Boston Consulting Group. And I work a lot in manufacturing supply chain domain on topics such as additive manufacturing, industry 4.0, advanced manufacturing, as well as manufacturing supply chain strategy and network optimization. And I do this across different industries, such as industrial goods, consumer practices, and also healthcare. Um, and I'm also the European co-lead of BCG's Additive Manufacturing Unit, and as such, I've done multiple consulting projects along the entire additive manufacturing value chain, starting with material suppliers or equipment providers, service bureaus, all the way to the end users, as well as um, governmental agencies. And I'm very honored to share my views on additive manufacturing today with my colleagues on the virtual podium here, and I look very much forward to your questions and a very interactive session. Excellent. I'm sure the audience will have plenty of questions for you. Uh, on your specialist topics there. So, um, Tim, perhaps you can say a few words about um, Jabil Anderson and what you do, at, do over there, please. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Michael, and uh, pleased to be here. Uh, so I am a Director of Product Management with uh, with, with Jabil Additive, and uh, where my role is, is really to uh, work and, uh, and and work manage, I own the relationships with a lot of the additive OEM uh, equipment suppliers. And uh, in addition to that, I help uh, work with our team to identify any gaps in Jabil's capability, and uh, you know, we're, we're we we see additive manufacturing in particular as as being potentially transformative and a very very big part of the, the future of Jabil. And 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 just a, a word about Jabil, uh, we're you know we're a, a large manufacturing services company, one of the largest in the world, in fact, and we have uh, 
manufacturing plants, uh, uh, you know, in uh, about 120 uh, plus manufacturing plants around the world and on the range of 230,000 employees. So large footprint, uh, obviously we're larger, much larger than additive. In fact, additive is a small part of what Jable does, but we really uh, do everything from, um, you know, and manufacturing services from electronics assembly, which is uh, likely what we're uh, known for, but uh, we do a lot of mechanicals. Uh, whether it's in healthcare, in aerospace, automotive, and other regulated industries across a range of manufacturing technologies. So, uh, you know, very interested to our and looking forward to our conversation today talking about how things are transforming and, and becoming more distributed. Yeah, and absolutely very well positioned to talk about the reality of, uh, of distributed manufacturing. But I think before we get into that, um, I think it's very useful if we maybe just talk what, about, about what do we mean by distributed manufacturing? Um, perhaps we can maybe set some definitions up, understand what it is, and then we can get into talking about whether this is, uh, this is happening and what the challenges are around it. So um, with that in mind, um, Randy, would you, uh, would you like to tell us about um, what you see as distributed manufacturing, please? Yeah, so I think... Uh... Distributed manufacturing has some unique characteristics. Uh, first of all, it's decentralized. So you're empowering local networks of manufacturers to serve a national or even a global community. Uh, and it's connected utilizing the internet for digital manufacturing. So uh, the long tail of the internet has hit many other industries from retail to even the service industry, but it hasn't really touched manufacturing because it's much harder to connect manufacturing in local areas to customers that are a distance away or they might have different needs. Through technology, everything from machine learning to other advancements through 3D printing, for example, uh, now that's possible. And that's really been some of the trends that are powering this trend for distributed manufacturing. Okay. Can you maybe tell us what do you mean by the long tail of the internet there? So when you think about if you are in retail, the internet now allows you to sell your goods online to customers that when you had a local business, and I remember when I used to visit my local lo bookstore before Amazon came along, growing up in New York City, you only could get what was available at that bookstore. And there could have been a bookstore that was in Michigan that had tremendous books or even one that was in Paris or, or somewhere in Asia. The internet came along and it touched that local bookstore and allowed that local bookstore to deliver their books throughout the globe. That's happened true now in the service industry as well, where you can sell your services online, places like Upwork, et cetera. But it isn't happening in manufacturing because that's much harder to translate in a digital thread. Now you can do that. Gotcha. Um, Tim, what's, uh, what's the Jable uh, definition? What's, how do you see distributed manufacturing over there? I think you're on mute. Uh, my apologies. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I absolutely concur with uh, Randy's uh, definition. And I think, uh, you know, decentralized, number one, uh, connected, and, uh, and number two, as Randy mentioned, and coordinated. And uh, we think those are some of the some of the key attributes of distributed manufacturing. And I think uh, when we, we a, lot of, a lot of times uh, folks may think of additive as the key distributed manufacturing technology when in fact uh you know the with the digital thread and the uh, connectivity that uh, you know that, that randy mentioned as well it applies to cnc it, it can apply to injection molding certainly looks a bit different but it's broader than uh, than just additive manufacturing and and, and at jable uh, you know, we are definitely are looking at that, and and uh, whereas Randy's looking out within the broader ecosystem, we certainly look at that as well, and connecting a lot of different manufacturing at Jable. We're looking uh, at that certainly, and how to leverage that. But we also, given our 120 plants, we're uh, working to coordinate. And, you know, number one, connect and coordinate those plants so that we can ship production to. Uh, to the uh, region where we have supply or where, where we have demand. So, so we look at it externally, but also uh, really take a hard look at how we can maximize the utilization of, of our assets that we have on the ground in different regions. And Mordred, does this, uh, what the chaps are saying, does this tally with, um, with your experience at BCG? Yes, absolutely. It really resonates with, with my basic definition of, uh, of distributed manufacturing, which basically for me is a decentralized manufacturing. And I mean, companies use it 
network of geographically separated manufacturing facilities, link them with uh, leveraging information technology and make sure that you actually print the parts or produce the parts where they are, uh, where, where they, you need them. And especially in the additive manufacturing context, that means that you can localize production at the place where you need the part. Uh, so uh, that can be as diverse locations as a battlefield or a hospital. Uh, and um, you can scale back on global supply chains and especially in such a pandemic situation as we are facing at the moment, we have seen some global supply chains under threat and under pressure. So additive manufacturing gives you the possibility to scale back these global supply chains have more regionalized supply chains. Uh, it allows you to uh, scale back inventory levels and also reduce lead time and finally also increase sustainability and the economic uh, footprint there. Great. So I think, um, yeah, we've um, sort of really tapped uh, some broad areas there of um, not only what, uh, what distributed manufacturing is, but also um, why, it's, uh, why it's of interest. Um, so I think let's get into now, let's talk about the reality of this. So, um, you know, I really want to know how is this actually manifesting itself outside of these, you know, what maybe less uh, generous people might call buzzwords, not me. Um, <laughs> for the printing industry, we don't trade in buzzwords. We want to look, look at what's really happening. So, um, I mean, perhaps, um, perhaps Tim, if you've got anything you can um, you can show us um, at Jable to tell us like how distribution manufacturing really works in practice away from the whiteboards, away from the theorizing. Yes, I have a I have a graphic here that I can I can certainly share, and it's uh, it's it's at a high level, but really um, I think a, a graphic that speaks to the idea of um, uh, decentralization. As we looked at our you know when we look at our global footprint and our plants, and this is uh, for the additive manufacturing network, and the idea being that we can have a design engineer in one location work through uh, the uh, design for additive manufacturing. Uh, they can work through prototyping, perhaps in a different location or even in the, sa in the same location as often as a case. They can validate the design and even do bridge production in, um, in one location. But then when it comes to ramping up uh, to volume production, or making a, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be volume production. It could be a you know, lot size of a few, and in some cases, even lot size of one, where we're able to shift that production to a local uh, uh, plant. Now, with the assumption that that local plant has the uh, quality management systems in place and has the uh, qualified uh, systems in place that meet those that customer's requirements but but we have a network where we're able to connect uh you know over 100 uh, uh 3d printers and uh, actually closer to 200 but we're able to do that and and del and be able to shift parts and we we like to think of it really as holding inventory not in in in, uh, in uh, uh, finished goods or work in, in process but holding inventory in digital files and raw materials at the, at the plant and, uh, and 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 the, another example, uh, in addition to being able to shift uh, end use parts, you know, design and, and develop and, and shift end use parts to the to the uh, uh, region uh, where the demand is, we also uh, are uh, really leveraging additive manufacturing to produce tooling, fixtures, manufacturing aids that help support our operations, and we're doing quite a lot of that, and 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 that's very helpful because we're able to design and upload. A, a file for a particular uh, function and all of our uh, thousands of engineers across our plants have access to that and can download it and print it uh, on their uh, uh, within their their site so hopefully that uh, that helps yeah absolutely and is this a recent thing for jail how long have you been doing this we've been working we've been on this journey for a little more than four years and uh, really over the last two years ramping up you know Putting, uh, you know, we've we've been and at Jable we've been using 3D printing and additive manufacturing uh, for uh, over a decade. Uh, in one example, uh, 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 printing metal uh, 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 injection or uh, uh, molds for injection machine uh, equipment with conformal cooling, and to uh, increase the cycle time of the uh, of the molds. So we've been we've been working, and certainly within prototyping, we've been using uh, uh, 3D printers and uh, for well over a decade in that space as well. But we've been on the journey for the last uh, four plus years to really try to drive adoption across uh, across Jabil. Um Before I, uh, I ask you, Randy, a question, the same question, I'd just like to remind uh, the viewers that uh, we will be taking Q&A 
um, in each section. So please do let us know if you've got any uh, comments, observations, or questions for the panelists. But um, Randy, perhaps you can tell us um, how Zometry uh, putting distributed manufacturing into practice. Yeah, so we use, uh, we have an online interface or platform where customers can upload their 3D CAD files, or they can also upload now just regular flat files. Um, and they tell us what kind of things they want in terms of post-processing and other, and other processes associated with the manufacturing. And then we use machine learning or artificial intelligence to create an, an instant price. And that instant price is based on the trends that we're seeing from manufacturers either locally in the United States or in Europe. We have networks in Europe and Asia, in the United States, and we also have a network in Asia. So depending on your geography, and if you're in the United States or in Europe, you can also quote parts that are produced in Asia as well, you'll see what the quote unquote market price we think is at that point for your particular parts. And we use machine learning because we have such a wide variety of parts that we're quoting all the time, it would be impossible to try to figure out exactly how each is manufactured. Instead, we we take this uh, this machine learning approach training on hundreds of different features. So that allows the customer to get an instant price, which has sort of been the sticky wicket in allowing uh, manufacturing to be an e-tailing experience. When you go to a retail site online, if you went to Amazon and there were no prices and there was just an RFQ, you'd be like, this sort of stinks, I don't wanna do it. We wanna give the customer that same ability to instantly get a price. And then in the back end, we've got thousands of manufacturers who we distribute the work to. And we use that same machine learning to help select the best solution for the customer for that particular job. Um, so that empowers a local manufacturer who might be in Houston, Texas, and, and let's say she's always been great at oil and gas, but the oil and gas industry is uh, very dormant or you know is not doing well, and so she's got a lot of open capacity. Boom, we may have a customer in, in Boston uh, who in the uh, medical device sector that needs more because that sector is overwhelmed from a manufacturing perspective. The suppliers are, he can tap into her capacity. And again, we use machine learning to link all of that. So, so we're producing lots of different things from 3D printing to machining, uh, injection molding, casting, sort of a, a, a very wide range of processes. Excellent. And I wonder if maybe, um, You've got the benefit of seeing many different companies operating in this space. Maybe you can tell us how some of um, some of those companies are working. Sure. So actually, I've seen huge advancements towards having a decentralized production place. Just recently, I've visited the factory of an iconic Italian sports car manufacturer, and they actually equipped their uh, their factory with 3D printers to print tools, jigs, and fixtures right along the assembly line. Yeah? Before, they used to have a central sourcing department uh, that would then supply these tools, jigs and fixtures basically centrally to all the different uh, plants out there in the network. And that was a tedious process. It took time um, and uh, also it was quite costly actually. And now you don't need to wait for expensive spare parts. You just go off and print them. Yeah? So that is just one example of what we see there. But then, um, however, we also currently see a significant hit on additive manufacturing of the on the additive manufacturing landscape driven by the COVID-19 pandemic crisis yeah? and I hope you can see my slide here so they are basically additive manufacturing is hit on three dimensions the first one is that end users are struggling so major additive manufacturing end users such as aerospace or automotive companies have been hit hard by the economic downturn and also business from healthcare industry has suffered yeah? the postponement of many elective surgeries has led to lower demand for uh, printed implants, for example. The second element what we see today is that specific additive manufacturing applications see lower demand. So across industries, cash-constrained companies have slashed R&D budgets. Um, and the reduction of R&D activity has a direct impact on additive manufacturing and the additive manufacturing market because the technology still is today predominantly used for prototyping purposes. And thirdly, Additive manufacturing players themselves are cutting down their costs um, and cost saving initiatives at AM players will likely hit also their R&D budgets, slowing down technology development. And consequently, these companies will not develop new applications um, as quickly as anticipated. And moreover, a large share of the technology development, we have to face it, comes from startups and they are at risk of reduced funding at the moment, which will amplify the effect. 
However, I don't want to paint a very dark picture here. I think if the players in the industry follow a, a clear value imperative to maximize the value for the additive manufacturing user, I truly believe that the COVID-19 crisis um, that currently massively hits also the additive manufacturing industry will not have a lasting effect. Yeah? So we will rather see a V-shaped recovery that brings us back on the original growth track uh, rather quickly. Okay, so we've got um, got some questions coming in as well for the panelists now, so please keep them coming. Um, Marie Thibault would like to know, Tim, can you tell us um, which type of parts are you producing and distributing manufacturing? Are these in metals, plastics, sure. drilling? What are, you, what are you doing? Yeah, so uh, so first of all, we're doing uh, additive, we're utilizing additive manufacturing across the spectrum from uh, metals uh, to polymers and, and composites. However, Due to the uh, nature of metals additive manufacturing, uh, it tends to be more capital intensive uh, and, and, and the, uh, uh, the metal printing portion is a smaller uh, piece of the overall part because there's always gonna be post-processing, typically machining, hardening, uh, post, you know, a, a fair amount more post-processing for metals parts. So, so that lends to be, I think, more cost effective for larger programs to have those assets in place. Uh, whereas on polymers, it's, uh, you know, so, so uh, you know, we're, we're applying uh, distributed manufacturing for polymer parts. Uh, certainly, as Wildrick mentioned, uh, you know, the manufacturer having uh, printing uh, tooling fixtures, uh, manufacturing aids right alongside the production floor, we're doing a fair amount of that as well. So. Yeah. Great, good stuff. And I think this is probably a question for you, uh, Randy. So um, Gerardo Ortiz asks, how does a shop with machines and quality systems, say in Latin America, join a distributed manufacturing network? Is that something you can help with or you can advise on? Yeah, so unfortunately, Xometry right now uh, is not in Latin America. Uh, but there are there are many Xometry springing, out, springing up throughout the world. So in we have competitors in, on every continent. So I would just uh, urge him to Google, uh, you know, locally, I don't know where he is in Latin America, but to Google it and, and there are many folks there. Or, you know, there's some great technology out there that'll enable you to become your own, build your own network. Um, and particularly on the 3D printing side, there's a lot of, it's, there's a lot of software tools off the shelf you can get to help with instant pricing. Uh, but there are other tools too. So. He could be the first in Latin America, and 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 uh, that'd be exciting. There's a business opportunity right there. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, another question has just come in from Justin um, Nussbaum, who asks, "What are the current limitations in AM you have to struggle with, um, or find workarounds for? Perhaps QA materials production, speed post processing, etc." Well, yeah, I'd say those are all kind of uh, <laughs> areas where the industry is learning every day on this and getting better. Um, but is there a particular um, limitation that um, the panelists sort of think of? It's not directly relevant yeah. to this, but yeah, uh, yeah I, can, I can maybe, uh, Michael, if you don't mind, jump in and sure. take a shot at that. I, I, I think those are all good uh, uh, areas that you need to work through. Um, uh, and uh, obviously, uh, from our view, it starts with materials. So the materials have to align with the application, what, the, uh, what are the temperature range, what's the uh, What's the strength that's needed, and things like that, and 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 we have seen some uh, some limitations there in the past. Although that's changing, more advanced materials, and more engineered materials are coming online. In fact, uh, we we have a, a team that's producing uh, engineered materials specifically for additive. That's uh, that's interesting. But I think uh, certainly the the QA, uh, the quality management mm -hmm. systems, are absolutely critical, and and being able to work through. Uh, whether it's uh, FFF technology or powder bed or resin-based photopolymers. Uh, uh, and and you know, I think additive is uh, certainly more nascent than uh, CNC or injection molding. Uh, with injection molding, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, proven uh, you know, over decades and refined over decades that, uh, it, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, the playbook is very well defined and, uh, and it works quite well. Whereas additive, it's still, uh, you know, it's still, uh, uh, you know, a lot to work through, but, uh, you know, we look at additive simply as another manufacturing technology and try to apply the same uh, rigor uh, to it uh, that we apply to other technologies. But all those are, I think, post-processing mm -hmm. as well. Speed speed drives productivity and that, that helps with your cost. 
uh, right? Helps get the, get the cost down. But uh, I think the, all of those have to be uh, have to be worked through and and really understood. Let's um let's sort of get in a bit uh, into some of the challenges that's uh, directly related to um, distributed manufacturing. And um, our kind um, host today, Free Your Mind, recently produced um, a very handy guide to success um, in distributed manufacturing, where they did take a look at several um, areas. And so I think we're going to sort of get into this in a couple of ways. Um, I'm going to run a poll, which um, all the audience and the panelists can participate in. So I'll just get that um, up and running now. And then I'll just take you through uh, some of these different um, different challenges we see. Um, or through your mind if I spent a lot of time identifying these. So the first one they talk about is how to improve supplier transparency through streamlined communication. So this is where we're dealing with situations where teams are compartmentalized, departments are operating in silos. And if you're dealing with a global company, well, you need some method to really um, make sure everyone's going in the right direction on that. Um, the next big challenge um, for your mind identified was um, the security threats um, and how to protect intellectual property when you're dealing with these digital assets. How do we secure files and make sure that, um, that they're being used how they're intended to be used and not, uh, not leaving the organization when they shouldn't? Um, another challenge, um, which I'd be very interested to hear how this is done currently, is if you're managing um, multiple sites in a global business, well, how do you ensure that um, you're delivering that same product, you're making something that's repeatable and doing that across these multiple sites? Um, another challenge is how to empower the leaders. Now, again, somebody's gonna be responsible for, uh, for managing these operations and it may be multiple people's responsibility. You want to obviously benefit from the skills your leaders have and uh, give, give managers the power to actually sort of make improvements. And the final, um, challenge that I think really ties all of these together is uh, is IT infrastructure. I mean, you can end up with a very bloated IT system if uh, if you're not careful trying to bring all of this uh, all of this technology together and, uh, and even getting the machines to talk to each other. So I'm going to leave the poll open for a little bit um, and sort of to allow everyone a chance to actually sort of uh, cast their sort of vote when they think the main challenges presented there. But um, I'd be very interested, um, Wildrick, perhaps you could. Uh, Give us your thoughts on what you think um, think the main challenge might be. Sure, sure. So on the one hand side, I think ensuring the repeatability is one of the key things because it really makes or breaks um, how additive manufacturing is perceived, whether it's perceived as a real manufacturing technology that we can use going forward, uh, or it's just you know um, some gimmick. Huh? So ensuring re um, repeatability is sort of the table stake that we have, uh, have there that we have to conquer. But then, in addition to that, one of the key further challenges that I see is actually when we think one step further um, is really about the security th threats and the intellectual property protection around uh, additive manufacturing. So um, an interesting aspect in that domain is um, in especially the use of the blockchain technology. Until recently, companies primarily used additive manufacturing either for prototyping or manufacturing low volume parts. And today we see that um, Additive manufacturing is more widely adopting industrial style manufacturing and industrial style manufacturing processes. And as manufacturers ramp up their use of printed parts, outsourcing to shared AM factories offer an attractive way to optimize the cost, the speed, and also the feasibility of your production if you don't have the, your own network now by, by now. Um, so, for example, manufacturers can print and obtain spare parts faster and produce unique and low volume parts more economically. But um, the key thing is before I can actually outsource that uh, part to somebody else and to an outsource as manufacturing provider, um, I have to overcome several obstacles. And these obstacles include protecting IP, creating digital, uh, direct digital connections between the additive manufacturing factory and myself and ensuring that um, there is an adherence to quality and process standards. And today, what we see is that um, for that, a lot of uh, players basically rely on intermediaries, such as 3D printing platforms, for example, to overcome these obstacles and to identify basically the best print shop and to trust in that platform that they actually can organize that printing for you. And then here, blockchain can really be a disruptor. So an automated blockchain bidding platform, for example, that uses smart contracts could eliminate actually or could threaten um, 
uh, could eliminate the need for a 3D printing platform and actually threaten also that business model here to some extent. Are you talking about something like Ethereum when you talk about these um, these sort of smart bidding contracts, some sort of network like that? Yes, yeah, it's basically sort of a blockchain network here where they then where it's basically done automatically and uh, where you have that in the blockchain, you have the contract in there and then um, can transfer the, the part basically within the blockchain or the data in the blockchain. And um, actually that that is um, disrupting uh, the industry as well. Huh? So, I mean, additive manufacturing today is disrupting the world in two ways. So on the one hand side, how we produce, and you all know that since you're in additive manufacturing, but the additive manufacturing itself is all, industry is, itself is also being disrupted, um, requiring each player to rethink basically its strategy and how to keep or gain a competitive advantage in that area. Great, and um, and Tim, maybe you could tell us about some of the challenges Jabel have uh, faced uh, during the four years you've been uh, running this program. Yeah, well, I think that uh, certainly the uh, you yeah, know some of the complexities that go with uh, you know fairly new technology being applied into uh, manufacturing. Uh, I absolutely concur that it, with that. I think the the quality management systems are absolutely critical for the site, and then working through the. Uh, uh, validation of the of the printer and uh, the capability of the printer and all the post processing steps. So it's uh, you know we look at that. We we first start with understanding uh, what industry uh, is is uh, are we serving uh, or industries and what are our, our customers specific requirements for this application and this program. And we we need to be able to scale the quality management system to align with that. We. We do everything from implants, uh, where it's uh, you know very rigorous, very uh, uh, you know uh, 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 stringent uh, quality management systems around 13485 and FDA approval, uh, all the way to um, you know parts uh, that go into consumer electronics. While the uh, end user has very stringent requirements uh, for those, uh, and the uh, a lot of it sometimes revolves around aesthetics. Uh, but the uh, the under it's not a regulated industry, for example, right? So whether it's uh, 13485, whether it's uh, AS9100 going into aerospace or ITF for for automotive, is really looking at what are the what are the regulated industries, what do they need, and then what does the general industry uh, need? And we try we remind ourselves every day that uh, you know it, it, you know often if it's not going in the body or if it's not going on a plane that you know we can scale back, but but really have the appropriate level of uh, quality management systems in place is, is absolutely critical because if you overburden the uh, the production, uh, you're not going to be uh, financially viable or economical. And uh, so it's it's a balance, right? And then I think an intellectual property is, is uh, you know, we don't, uh, Jabel uh, doesn't have products necessarily, uh, but we make other people's products. So we, we are uh, you know, responsible for handling and managing uh, the geometries and the, and and our customers' IP. So we take that extremely uh, serious, and 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 it's 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 a it's a, a, a big responsibility. But we really uh, look at that and understand that for for Jable to uh, uh, continue what we're doing and to be able to grow and expand uh, our customers' intellectual property is absolutely uh, paramount that we protect that. Yeah, potentially a real reputational risk there. If that's uh, if there is exactly, yeah, yep. absolutely. Um, Randy, perhaps you could tell us about uh, the zometry uh, experience and the challenges you've sort of um, seen and helped uh, helped companies overcome. Yeah, so I think this is a great list, and it's all super relevant. Um, and I appreciate particularly the other panelists' their perspectives. Uh, and for additive, I think some of this is more relevant than for others, but. Uh, I think the biggest barrier right now to distributed manufacturing, if you want to get to real scale and you want to move beyond prototyping, uh, is definitely the communication. Because the devil is in the detail in end use production. And so, and historically, you're used to either having a local relationship. So, literally, you're going to visit the local manufacturer, you're standing with them and showing them the specs of your job. Or they're so tightly integrated, you have that traditional supply chain where there's that tight integration that you've worked through the product with them. Uh, you've done, you know, test run, first article inspections. It's been a ongoing process. Uh, a, it's been a marriage. And, and that's developed over weeks or over months with many phone calls or visits or, 
or online chats, whatever it might be. If distributed manufacturing is going to be an agile way to quickly produce thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of parts, you have to somehow replicate in quick time that, that level of detail and communication. That is really tough. Um, and that's where we invest a lot of people. So zometry has got you know, almost 400 people. A lot of our people are about facilitating the conversation between the manufacturer and the customer. And that's where we also invest a lot of our, of our IP or our, our, uh, our programming time to try to make those online tools more and more efficient as well. I think that's a barrier that has to be overcome for a company to say, I'm gonna produce my product somewhere else and I'm gonna order it online and I'm gonna do that all through a digital threat. These other things are critical. The security, all these absolutely underpins it, but I can't even get to that spot if I'm not comfortable that that person knows what I want and, and, and there's a lot to tell them. So I, that, that is the single biggest issue that we see and that we work the hardest on. These other ones, again, critical, but that's sort of the table stakes. So do you think then the um, 2020s pandemic and the fact that now a lot of us are working remotely or working from home, do you think that's hastening um, the trend towards distributing manufacturing? A absolutely. I mean, our business has exploded because people – because their local manufacturers got shut down. You know, states, some states had very, I think, somewhat irresponsible, even they shut down critical suppliers at, at Hawk, but there was bad communication. So people got shut down and companies that used to depend on their local manufacturer were stuck. Um, or we had, again, we have suppliers in China. We had customers who were only using China when China first got shut down. Suddenly they had no other options too. And the only thing they could do was to go online to places like Zometry. And there are other Zometries too, but they'd go online to online digital distributed manufacturers. And so that we sort of had a new influx of customers who had never done this before, but were forced to do it. And we were learning. We're learning now, hey, they're not as savvy as the, the, the first adapters. You know, the folks in the additive industry were, you know, they kind of rushed to it. They're some way ahead of the chain on these other ones. So now some other people want to do that in stamping and other industries. Hmm, that looks different. We're, we're, we're scrambling to adapt and, and, and enhance our platform for that. Everybody's going to have to do that moving forward. Good to hear AM's in the lead again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's take a look at this poll. Um, we've had um, as a, a real clear sort of challenge, of, well, according to the respondents, is that this um, – Ability to embrace complexity and ensure repeatable results across multiple facilities. That's that's almost 50%, well, over 50% of people see that as the biggest challenge. Wildrick, is that something you expected to see? Uh, yes, actually, actually, yes, because um, um, whenever I speak with, uh, with also maybe the more critical people around additive manufacturing, um, then this is one of the first things that come up because they say, well, the quality is not so good. I print a part one time, then I print it a second time, and it's not the same quality. Yeah, it's, so this is one of the key things that we have to work jointly as a as an ecosystem, basically forward toward to it. That the repeatability um, is there. That one part is like the other when I do print it, and uh, especially in industrialized manufacturing context, I need to have that reliability. Once I I come over this threshold uh, of having actually a good quality system in place, and, and Tim mentioned that already, that you're working intensively on that one. Once you have this in place and, and you can actually ensure the repeatability, that will be really, and, and make sure that every single part is the same, then um, you can actually really jumpstart uh, into the next, next basically, industrialized age of additive manufacturing. And Randy, does, that, does this surprise you on the simplification of the IT infrastructure? Is the, uh, everyone seems to think that's fine. <laughs> we've, we've got there. No problem. Yeah, no problem. I, think that, I, I think that's fair. I don't think that's a big, I think to the extent there are shortfalls, people can, can uh, bolster them. But we need that IT infrastructure for so many things we do online already. So people are already uh, investing in that. That's not unique to distributed manufacturing. So I think that's a given now for any any company that wants to succeed. So, and, and Tim, polling also rather low is the challenge um, to protect uh, intellectual property. So people seem confident that um, that this is being addressed. Is that sort of uh, seem reasonable? Well, I think a number of these, like the IT uh, infrastructure, uh, empowering leaders, any any type of change management. Yes, of course, you're going to have to do that, and and uh, you know, change management is difficult, and IP. 
Um, yeah, I think there are th there are tools uh, in 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 place. Um, I think it uh, largely it, it a lot of this is is also table stakes. If you're really going to succeed and thrive within distributed manufacturing, uh, of course you need all of these. As far as which could you know likely is you know which is a the main challenge, I, I would concur with the poll at this point uh, that it is the. Um, you know the repeatability uh, of the uh, and the complexity and and as I said we we look at additive manufacturing specifically like uh, another manufacturing process so we are bring, we look at it and say and, and it's interesting when you look uh, not not to not to uh, dwell on additive manufacturing but I think it's relevant uh, to the conversation and when you talk with uh, the OEMs and the the, the companies producing the additive manufacturing equipment and even materials. Uh, it's very interesting conversation when you're engaged with someone who comes from a manufacturing background and, right. and where additive companies that have spun out of, they're doing something in parallel in manufacturing and, they're, and they're, then they move into additive. They have a completely different mindset than someone that has grown up maybe out of a university and developing technology and, and, and built a platform. Maybe it's suitable for, uh, for manufacturing, but it's a different mindset when you have conversations with them about overall equipment effectiveness, uh, in time, uh, mean time between failure, et cetera. Uh, and it's everyone, everyone is the companies that are going to be successful have to get there and have to be looking at it no different than a CNC or injection uh, molding machine or any other technology. Okay, I mean, talking about the sort of the wider network there, we've got a question from Garrett Lewis, who's um, asking for the panelists' perspective on what is your view on machine learning as a tool to improve machine performance across such a network? For example, finding the best initial print parameters. Who would like to tackle that one? I, I can take a stab at it. Certainly, mm -hmm. we look at machine learning, and uh, but but I guess it's. Um, you know, to what degree and how deep you go uh, with that. Uh, uh, I think initially, particularly within additive, uh, you know, machines are the point of, of, of monitoring the machine uptime, the material consumption, and really allowing that to feed back into our cost ass assessments or, or uh, assumptions to be able to validate that. That's kind of at a very basic level. And then from there, you can uh, go up and look at, um, you know, uh, further optimizing that uh, you know the the equipment, and and we're on the for additive, we're on the early uh, stages of that. Uh, but we certainly see uh, machine learning uh, overall across our manufacturing technologies as something that uh, we really need to need to determine how to leverage. And, and uh, yeah, yeah. I, I remember recently we saw some work by um, Argonne National Laboratory and uh, Texas A and M University where they were using. Um, I think it was thermal images and they were taking the data and then applying their sort of algorithm to that to try to predict um, what the level of defects would be. So there's there's some real sort of high level research going into this, whether this has made it to the, the factory floor yet. So I think that might be a little while. Mm -hmm. I, I think just to, to jump in here. So we don't do this. I mean, we use machine learning more on the, on the pricing side uh, versus this. But there are companies that are focused on this exact problem. So this is a great question. And I think even the the, uh, the PLM software companies uh, are also from Dassault and Autodesk and PTC. Uh, they may not be using machine learning per se, but they're definitely trying to figure out which parts are optimized for additive versus others. And I know there are specific OEMs, um, large OEMs in places like automotive that are doing the same thing. They're building internal libraries and trying to use uh, AM, I mean, uh, machine learning and other technology to try to help their engineers decide, is this a prime candidate for, for additive? Uh, on the machine level, probably not, but just those parameters route, whether or not the part fits it, that, that's where there's a lot of focus right now. Um, so I, I think it's smart, and I think it, the, the, the person there, it's question is a good one, and I think people will get to that level as well through these distributed manufacturing networks. Yeah, Randy, I, I, if I can jump in, I, I would agree. I think there's a lot of work going on on the front end around simulation, part selection. Uh, and, and that's a big problem to be able to identify and select a part that's suitable for additive. Uh, you know, if you have a library of uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, parts, uh, being able to um, select which parts might be suitable for additive, uh, you know, that could be an onerous task. And you have 
dozens of engineers on that task, whether as, as if you have an automated process that can select parts and at least kick out the, 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 high, or the, the high likelihood, and then they can uh, have a couple of engineers focus on those and, and carry those forward. So, yeah, I think that's a, you know, some really great work doing, being done there. Mm -hmm. We've got a few more questions in the uh, in the chat, but I'm going to come back to them um, during this next section where we're going to talk a little bit about um, the future and where this is heading. So what's the vision for distributed manufacturing? And um, we've touched, I suppose, a little bit on the benefits um, here as well. Um, but if we can get into this um, really. So why why are we actually doing this? And <laughs> what's the what's the vision for distributed manufacturing? What's the, the Jable vision on this, um, Tim? Yeah, so it, you know, I, just listening to the conversation here, I think that uh, one, it's it's exciting uh, to look at distributed manufacturing, and and uh, we have our view on it, but I think it's 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 very exciting to think about the democratization of manufacturing, uh, and I would say probably for you know in our careers, it'll be the democratization for manufacturing for modest volumes, right? You're not going to distribute typically. Uh, you know where you need millions of parts uh, a day in some cases. So and that and, and so those that's going to continue. And I don't think it's it's uh, either or or one or the other. I think it's a it's very complementary to the centralized high volume uh, manufacturing. So and I think what's what's driving it really is is consumer uh, the demands of the consumers. Uh, right when we look through the through the supply chain. Uh, consumers are more powered, empowered today than they've ever been around what choices they make. That's shrinking uh, product life cycles. That's expanding the proliferation of uh, product variations. So the, we're, we're moving from uh, uh, lot sizes of uh, hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands, or even from 100 to 100 to lot size of few. And and I think that's uh, one of the things that's that's driving the uh, yeah, you know, the, the interest around distributed manufacturing and, and also the geopolitical uh, uh, world uh, that uh, that we live in, uh, you, know, uh, you know, moving and, and we're getting a lot of calls about shifting manufacturing from one region to another, depending upon what's happening with tariffs and with, uh, you know, with the nature of that and, and demand. Yeah. I think tied into that, um, one of the, um, the viewers, Anthony uh, Cami, um, has said, um, a question which is relevant to what you're talking about there, where um, they're asking, do you feel the main limitation to the wider spread of distributed manufacturing is on the technology side or in the conceptualization of products? So adding value to the product by personalization or by delocalizing production. So you're talking about lower volumes there. How would you uh, respond to that? Yeah, well, I think the technology, particularly around additive, is uh, uh, being able to, and 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 I, and I guess the main reason that we continue to dwell on additive largely, it's a fixtureless manufacturing process, right? You don't need tooling like that you like you might in injection molding. So you can produce parts quickly and few, and and produce those uh, across the same, you know, and ramp up the volume, and 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 the cost per part is going to remain relatively flat, right? Whereas mm -hmm. with injection molding, as you amortize, uh, you know, the first few you're spending a great deal for, and as you amortize the tooling cost, uh, uh, it's, uh, it becomes more expensive. So I think, you know, there the additive uh, it, it enables the, the, the low volume uh, production, uh, assuming that you can meet, meet the requirements. But I think also the personalization, the, uh, well, I guess I would distinguish between personalization and customization, two different two different uh, things there, but uh, that I think also is is driving. And we're seeing, we, we saw it in hearing aids uh, through, uh, and, and the, I think uh, uh, Wilderick uh, spoke to that, but also uh, dental aligners is another, uh, you know, when we think about personalization, uh, customization uh, product that, that the uh, consumer's uh, uh, thinking is is shifting and, uh, and they're wanting that uh, personalization, customization more and more. These products with a market size of one, yes. Um, we we yeah we refer to that as as lot size of one and and uh, and and putting uh, infrastructure in place to be able to deliver that and it's uh, yeah it's it's very interesting. Okay, Randy, where do you see um, where do you see distributed manufacturing going from your from where you're sitting? I think you may be on mute. Yeah, sorry about that. I think there's two conversations here, and we're mixing them together because they're interrelated. But one is the future of additive manufacturing, which is obviously 
super critical to distribute it and part of it. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the comments from Tim, and, and I think those are spot on uh, about, about a lot of that. Uh, I think there is a more serious trend that distributed manufacturing is already addressing right now in middle of COVID, and that will continue and accelerate as we have more black swan events, as climate change begins to really wreak havoc. And it's, it's not a question of if now, it's just when and to what degree, and as we see that, which is we are gonna see supply chains collapse overnight, as we saw when China was shut off, or half the United States was shut off, or Europe was shut off, and that is forcing manufacturers who need to get ventilator parts, who need to produ produce masks. You could not get a mask out of China, and the United States had no internal capacity to build masks. And there's so and this is not just in mechanical parts, which we focus on, but it's it's for the chemicals we need for testing and other things like that. These emergencies, these global emergencies, which are going to accelerate, not decelerate, require things to be made. So everything we do every day, you can all be virtual at home, but everything you're doing is empowered by something that was manufactured. Mm -hmm. And if we can't depend on our traditional supply chain because continents are shut off uh, or countries or states are shut off, distributed manufacturing is your only outlet. So it will become pervasive. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be additive. I mean, I think additive always plays a role in it. I think there are serious, and we talked about them uh, from materials to speed to cost. And I think Tim's comments about, and this is where J-Bill's so good, because J-Bill knows all kinds of manufacturing. So when they brought in additive, they understood what an engineer worries about or thinks about or a buyer thinks about or an end consumer. And I think if additive is really going to catch on, you have to make sure all those opinions are brought in. Because when you go to a, we've had customers come to us, big companies that have to bring us a library of a thousand parts and say, we want to 3D print these, tell us. And when we tell them the price and the lead times, they go, this is insane. Uh, so we need to learn all that. But I think regardless of that, and I think additive will play a bigger, bigger role. Distributed manufacturing is to a certain extent going to save our planet. Uh, we're going to need it to get through these 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 giant hurdles and trials we're going to face, and we've already faced. Oh, Michael, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Michael, you're on mute. Uh, Michael, you're yeah. <laughs> I knew I was going to do it at least once. <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, I just about to put Randy on the spot there, and uh, it might be rather unfair, but you mentioned it's going to become pervasive. Um, what's the time frame for when distributing distribution manufacturing gets to that stage? It's it's now. I mean, everybody is, and and it gets, it's not just third parties like Zometry. It's company like you know J Bill that does that for other companies, and it's the OEMs themselves connecting their factories. It's BCG. I'm sure going in and talking to companies about making sure they can link all their capacity because there's lots of capacity. Capacity is not our issue right now. It's tapping into that capacity. Uh, it's like the printing industry, something that I know as well, where you have plenty of capacity. How do you optimize it? It's the same thing in manufacturing. Lots of capacity out there. How do we optimize it? Distributed does it, but it's happening right now. It will, it is, and will be the biggest thing. And, and again, you've already seen that with with COVID. A lot of what's been made now, whether it's been printed or machines or laser cut, etc., or ejected molded, has been through distributed manufacturing. Well, Drick, um, for, again, maybe a rather unfair question, given the, the volume of information we've been talking about, but um, what's your perspective on the vision for, uh, for distributed manufacturing? Is BCG advising clients to head down this path now? Right. So, well, actually, we have to face it. When it comes to realizing the growth potential of additive manufacturing, many industry players have been their own worst enemy. Uh, although equipment providers in particular um, have enjoyed high margins by employing a razor razor plate business model um, that led also to intense competition within and across the value chain segments. And that has impeded end users' uh, adoption of the industrialized additive manufacturing. And um, as a result, despite the high expectations uh, since a couple of years, the industry still remains an inch market today. Um, however, let me pull that up here. Um, However, to, to unleash the potential of additive manufacturing, AM players should collaborate to advance the technology, identify new applications, and enable end users to fully exploit its advantages. 
And I believe that applying the concept of a business ecosystem is the best way to actually accomplish this. Business ecosystems have important advantages over classical organizing structures, such as hierarchical supply chains or vertically integrated companies. For example, the partners in an ecosystem can contribute their specific capabilities to co-innovate to develop new products and services. Ecosystems have the beauty that they can scale quickly because of their modular structure, and it makes it easy to add partners. And then um, they are very flexible and resilient, enabling a large breadth of the offering, and they can also quickly adapt to the changing customer requirements. Um, and the additive manufacturing industry can apply many learnings from other successful business ecosystems when you look out there in order to foster that collaboration among the independent companies. And I truly believe that the additive manufacturing industry has the potential to have a market size of approximately 200 to 300 billion um, US dollar in 2035, which translates into a take rate of roughly 1% of the global manufacturing market. So, I think there's quite some potential that we can can drive towards too. Michael, I think you did it again. I keep doing, doing that, <laughs> that right. I was just going to take a couple of quick questions. Um, and one one for you here, Tim. Um, How is Jable ensuring repeatability today? Yeah, so for uh, I assume it's related that's related to additive. Uh, so uh, what we do is we go through a validation process to validate a printer for uh, specific mechanical and and dimensional uh, properties. Uh, and of course, that actual process will will vary depending upon the model of printer, how much you know dialing the printer in. And then we uh, we also validate that each time we place a printer. So we come up with a base uh, baseline of tests that we want to run uh, initially. And the first time through, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of heavy lifting. But then as we take that uh, particular model of printer and the material and place it in different, uh, either in the same location or different locations, we have a, uh, you know, a, 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 a IP, uh, uh, or kind of the, the installation uh, process, the operational and uh, the, the production process. So there are different phases we go through, but uh, it, it really comes down to quality management systems, uh, identifying the baseline on the front end and then uh, comparing that as we put the, before we put them into production. And then of course, monitoring them throughout uh, uh, the production process. Yep. Okay. Well, I mean, it's been fascinating um, hearing from all three of you today, and I really do appreciate you taking the time. And also, um, thank you to the audience as well for uh, for attending uh, this latest edition of the Pretty Friday Talk Show. Um, if you're interested, there's more information about the keys to success in the distributed manufacturing model um, that's been posted in the chat, so you can visit that link. Um, also, the next. Um, webinar will be on digitization and on-demand spare parts in the oil and gas industry, which is something we touched on briefly here. So uh, we're going to have some great guests, um, including the CEO, CEO of Adero, um, joining us for that event. Um, so again, um, Tim, Randy, Ulrich, thank you very much for your time today. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. And thank you for your yep. mind for hosting us and uh, also for America Makes for supporting uh, the event and we will see you at the next one thank you everyone thank bye you bye 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 bye, bye. bye.